Now, I imagine uh, you're here this week to talk about what's going on in the cloud. But I hope while you're here, you're still considering uh, making smart use of the resources down here on Earth. Um, you know, I'm personally a big fan of our planet, and I can't, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, even though there's a, there's a NASA display about 50 yards that way about finding the next planet with life on it. Um, we need to uh, consider that we're probably going to be here for a little while. So um, even though our cloud is not white or fluffy and, and unpredictable moisture is usually a bad thing, it has real impact here on Earth, the resources that we use. Um, so this session today is all about uh, focusing on a commitment to the environment. What does it mean to prioritize sustainability as we make decisions um, as IT practitioners, as we set goals for our organizations, and ultimately in the products that we design and develop? Uh, you're going to hear from three companies that care a lot about the smart use of the Earth's resources. My name's Chris Talbot. Uh, I work in Google Cloud. Um, I work with customers across the globe, helping them understand how a move to the cloud can help them become more sustainable. Um, and I'll share some of that experience and, and why Google Cloud is a sustainable platform. But I'm, uh, I'm honestly really excited about what my friends are going to share uh, about a company that is literally an icon for environmental stewardship and how do they incorporate that into their organization. Um, and then a, a solar company who is you know, effectively using cloud technology to make renewable energy accessible for all. So let's get right into it. Uh, at Google, similar to our mission of making information universally accessible and useful, um, we also have a mission to build sustainability into everything that we do as a company. Um, and you know, breaking down what does sustainability built in mean, it means from hardware to the offices that we build to the data centers that we build, we're going to prioritize sustainability in that value chain. Um, that could mean incorporating as much as 75% uh, post-consumer recycled plastics in our hardware to uh, focusing on buying ugly produce in our cafes, buying all the funny looking fruits and vegetables that would otherwise not be purchased by you know, restaurants and food providers. But I'm gonna focus on uh, the two areas that are probably most impactful for you as a, as a cloud user or a potential cloud user, and that's data centers and renewable energy. And, um, you know, within these two areas, we've really taken that sustainability mission to heart by um, innovating and building more technology back into our environmental practices to effectively make them more sustainable. By pushing our innovation kind of upstream, you as a user downstream get a better experience. So I'll take a second to highlight some of those areas that, you know, essentially the stuff that you can only get from, from Google Cloud. Uh, first, data centers are at the heart of our company and everything that we do. It powers Google Cloud Platform. It powers all of the other Google products um, that billions of users throughout the world use. And you know, this is really the critical part of the sustainability story for you as a user. Um, because all of us are increasingly going digital. And digital transformation isn't about just using new technology stuff. It's honestly about betting your business on a digital future. And ultimately, you're going to use more technology stuff, which means more data center use and more energy. And with 2% uh, or more of the world's electricity already going to data centers, this is only going to grow. Um, but it's actually one area where innovation can have an incredible impact. Uh, compared to five years ago, we actually deliver seven times the compute per watt of energy that we use in our data centers. Google Cloud's actually the best at using, uh, getting the most out of the energy that we draw. Um, the way that you measure this is something called uh, power usage effectiveness, or PUE. Um, it's calculated by taking you know, the total energy that you use in your data center and dividing that by only the stuff that you use to actually provide computing power. For every kind of watt of energy that you use, how much are you going to have to use for all the other stuff, like facilities and cooling and all the things that make a data center work? For us, we only need 11% extra stuff to do that. So it comes down to an average PUE across our fleet of 1.11. And uh, you, know, you as a user of Google Cloud products and services, 
you get to take advantage of that. It's 50% better than the, the average data center out there, and that's efficiency that we deliver to you in using our services. And um, you know, unique to Google, one of the ways we're able to achieve that efficiency is we actually use our own machine learning technologies in our data centers. Um, you know, when it comes to controlling a data center, it's actually a really you know, complicated and unique beast. There's millions of components that are relatively fickle to unpredictable changes in the environment. So when you're managing a data center, trying to manage these components in a very manual way is, is really inefficient. And kind of out of the box, you know, manufacturing or control systems, industrial control systems, um, they aren't universally applicable across the data center. So when you're facing a challenge of trying to get better at predicting unpredictable things from millions of inputs, neural networks can do a really good job at doing that. Um, that's what they're designed to do, essentially learn from millions of inputs and get better about predicting the future. So our machine learning actually controls the cooling, which is the major part of the energy draw within a data center across our fleet. Um, you know, I mentioned the other area being renewable energy and energy in general uh, that's critical to you as a user of Google Cloud. Um, you know, running our business across Google requires us to use a lot of electricity. And you know, com combating climate change requires all of us to transition to a, you know, a clean energy future. So at Google, we match every unit of electricity that we use across our company with a unit of renewable energy that we've purchased somewhere from a zero carbon source. Um, in pursuing this goal to reach 100% match of our energy, we became the largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy in history. Um, and some of that investment in renewable energy actually goes to wind power. And uh, similar to our data centers, we found ways to make unique use of the Google technology to help make wind power more valuable. So the thing with renewable energy is it has to make financial sense too. That 100% match that I just showed you, it represents over $5 billion in investment from Google. And uh, in order to make financial sense, uh, it, the energy that we use, it has to be more predictable to be more valuable to the grid. Energy that you can't predict is actually less valuable than energy that you can get cons consistently contributing to the grid. So we apply the ML to our uh, wind farms to predict how they're going to produce energy 36 hours in advance. And this machine learning algorithm was essentially trained on weather forecasts. And by integrating this into our wind farms, we were actually able to increase the value of the wind energy that we were producing by 20%. So with Google working to make renewable energy a viable and cost-effective source for our operations, you as a user get that benefit. The benefit, essentially, of being carbon neutral. So any organization that moves infrastructure or applications to Google Cloud Platform, uh, you reduce the net carbon emissions associated with your usage to zero. Everything that runs in our cloud is net carbon free. I know I, I just said the same thing three times, but I, I want to get this point across. It's critically important. If your organization sets any sort of emissions or sustainability goals, um, you know, this is the part that enables you as a developer or an IT infrastructure person to participate in that goal setting and to actually be a champion for sustainability and a champion for change within your organization. Um, you know, ultimately, we at Google invest in sustainability to empower all of you organizations, governments, nonprofits, individuals, to use the, the technology in our cloud and our other applications to create a more sustainable world. Um, you know, one part is the platform, Google Cloud Platform, available to you to build on. And we actually, we really believe that, um, you know, in addition to, you know, price and high performance and reliability of our systems, you should get sustainability built into the platform that you use. One of the other ways you know, we're really focused on empowering you as customers is through data. Um, we all know information can, make, it can help us make better decisions about our future. So 
uh, lots of the other teams throughout Google, the GEO team in particular, um, works with research and environmental organizations to get the information that we have into the hands of scientists and policymakers that can make a difference. Um, Earth Engine, the example here, has enabled um, you know, 100,000 plus scientists throughout the, the globe to get a deeper understanding of our planet. So there are opportunities available like this to you too as a cloud user. Um, BigQuery in particular has lots of publicly available geographic data sets that you can use and help make better decisions about our future. But honestly, the rest is, uh, is up to you to take this platform, to take the data, to take the partnership that we have and, and build for the future. And I, I honestly hope you do because we've all seen through um, you know, the beautiful, very high definition lens of our next presenter, what's at stake for our planet. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Melissa Wiley from National Geographic Partners up to the stage. Thank you. Thanks. Great. So thank you, Chris. And thank you to Google for having me here today. So I thought before I jumped into this, I'd offer you guys a little bit of inspiration to get started. I think that's what we do best at National Geographic is we inspire people. Don't worry, I'm a professional. Photography has the power to... Good photography has the power. 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 The power to undo your assumptions about the world. Change your perspective on life. And surprise people with something that they had no idea existed. Inspire, horrify. Stop time for a moment. It is an incredible passport to people's lives. Images are so powerful that they can change the course of people's lives they can change the course of history. Photography can change the world. Never underestimate the power of a still frame. How can we make the horror that we see in these pictures stop? When people see those photographs, I hope that they are overcome with a sense of urgency. I want them to ask and scream for change. To see that, oh, that could be me, and make connections between people. It's a universal language. One little hammer a weapon against what's wrong out there you have to care you really have to care it sounds simple but I, I even get emotional sometimes when i talk about it. you cannot do superior work if you're indifferent how are you going to do that it's not the individual photograph it's what you do with it and who you engage with it that makes it powerful while we live in a world where it's easy to say that people don't care anymore it's been proven to me time and again that people do care how could you ever be done no you don't ever think you're done you just have to do it. There's always one more picture, just one more. It takes like years of working. Just wait a minute, one more. Just to hone your vision. Then I'll be done. No, I won't. If you want to be a photographer, particularly a photojournalist, you want to learn about the world. And you want to learn about yourself. And you want to find things that you genuinely care about. Because that will be the source of the greatest work you'll do. Um, so I hope everybody enjoyed that. My name is Melissa Wiley and I am Vice President of Digital Products at National Geographic. And I'm sure as you can probably all guess after watching that video, I've got just about the best job in the world. Um, I get to work with photographers, scientists, and explorers who, just like all of you who have gathered here, care deeply about the planet. And today I just wanna offer you a brief glimpse into how we take our own public message about creating a public, a, sorry, a planet in balance and we also look at ourselves inwards to see how we can incorporate that message into our own corporate responsibility. So the spirit of exploration has always really been at the heart and soul of everything we do at National Geographic. Before there was Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, National Geographic was really how we connected the world to people, cultures, and critical changes in the planet. But now, more than ever, we understand the importance of using photography and storytelling to inspire people to take action. For us, it all starts with a sense of purpose. National Geographic believes that when people understand about the world around them, 
they care deeply about it and they want to take responsibility for it. On top of our television and our magazine, National Geographic reaches approximately half a billion people across our social channels. And with that scale comes the opportunities to really bring communities together to drive change. And that's why we tell the stories of our photographers and our scientists and our explorers who are documenting our world and in order to inspire everybody here to go out and make change. But not only does National Geographic have a long history of being a leader at inspiring all of you, we've long been a leader at looking inward at ourselves to understand what actions we can take towards sustainable business practices. So we've adopted a corporate responsibility policy that we share with pretty much everyone we work with. We share this with employees, we share it with vendors, partners, and all of our suppliers. So we want to work towards carbon neutrality. We're working towards a zero landfill waste. We want to practice wise resource stewardship. And most importantly, we really want to have a healthy and engaged workforce. At Nat Geo, we're committed to operating our, um, faci our facilities as sustainably as possible. Um, our headquarters in Washington, D.C. first became LEED certified in 2003. Um, through our efforts of tracking energy, maintenance, waste, and office supplies, we were able to increase that from silver to gold in 2009. And we actually achieved our sixth certification just last year in 2018. In addition to this great work, uh, National Geographic also now receives 50% of our energy from solar. A um, few other accomplishments that we achieved in just 2018, we earned Energy Star certifications for our headquarters. We've also been going through a process to renovate our buildings. Um, as part of that renovation, we're now putting a kitchen on every floor that offers things like reusable dishware, low landfill coffee, um, Bottle, bottleless water fountains. Um, as part of our renovations, we've been uh, recycling tons of office furniture, art supplies, um, as well as electronics and metal from the renovations. And with that money that we save, as well as the proceeds from our products, we're then able to reinvest back into our nonprofit arm who has awarded over 14,000 grants so that more curious people can go out into the world and inspire all of you to take action. Our goal is to identify, cultivate, and develop the change makers of today and tomorrow. One example of this is our Planet or Plastic initiative that we launched in May of 2018. Um, this is a multi-year effort about raising awareness around the global plastic crisis in order to help um, reduce the amount of single-use plastics that's making it into the world's oceans. As part of this initiative, uh, not only is National Geographic asking all of you to go out and take a look at your own usage of single-use plastic and pledge to reduce that use, we're also taking a look inward. And we have uh, initiated a plastic audit across our entire organization so that we can understand the extent of our use across our supply chain as well as work towards eliminating it. So at National Geographic, we also understand the power of technology to create connections and drive empathy. Um, and most importantly, increase our awareness and understanding of one another. So this is one of my favorite videos. What you're taking a look at here um, is an example of our VR theater that we launched uh, in October of last year. So we now have an Oculus Go headset that is hooked up to all 400 seats in the room so that everybody can have the same 360 experience at the same time. It's really fun. Um, so, however, we realize that not only do we have the opportunity and responsibility to connect our consumer towards environmental issues, but we realize that we need to take a look at our internal infrastructure as well. So the National Geographic Image Collection. 
Um, the National Geographic Image Collection is the record of truth for all photography assets at National Geographic. This database not only holds the photographs themselves, but it holds information about contracts, rights, um, and actually the physical location. So if you want to go down and actually find that original Afghan girl print, you're going to take a look in the image collection and that's going to tell you where to go and actually pull that print off the shelves. Last year we found ourselves in a situation where that system had to be taken offline. Um, and while that was extremely, and I, extremely is an understatement, it was extremely inconvenient for everyone who uses the system, it gave us an opportunity to take a step back and really take a look at that 20-year-old system and make some critical decisions about how we wanted to move forward with it. As a result, we decided to partner with Google. We know that Google uh, shares similar passions as National Geographic around sustainability. The actions that took this system offline, unfortunately, really didn't earn us a lot of goodwill with our photographers. And we knew that the steps that we took to bring the system back online, we really wanted to be able to say that we were storing their photographs as sustainably as possible. We wanted to be able to prove to our photographers that we recognize the importance of their collections and that we share common values with them. So um, we partnered with Google and we moved the system to the cloud in just over two months. So this was an exciting process for us and it's really been a huge success story for us to bring this back online. We're now in the process of partnering with Google to really try and understand those energy savings that we took when we migrated this system from our on-premise facility into the cloud. So we've been able to provide Google with a bunch of statistics about our legacy system. Um, and then Google is helping us to calculate that to really understand what savings that we've earned. So this study is still ongoing. We're still, we're just starting to get in some early learnings. Um, but some of the things that we are seeing is that um, we are going to incur greenhouse emission savings over the course of a year that equal a around heating an average size home for about 30 to 40 months or driving a car for about 25,000 miles. Um, and those, those stats are exciting to us. They are relatively small, but the image collection it is also a very small portion of our overall infrastructure. Um, and we feel like this is going to make a great case study for us to then go to our executives and say that we think sustainability needs to be part of our uh, benchmarks in all of our infrastructure planning. It's going to help get us towards that carbon neutral goal that we talked about earlier. So that's just a brief look. i um, going to now hand this over to Jake. We've talked to you a lot about um, the work National Geographic has done to look at our own corporation. Jake's going to come up here and talk about um, products that you all can use to take a look at your own footprint. Hi, everyone. I'm Jake Walkman. I run software product and engineering for SunPower. And if you're not familiar with SunPower, maybe if you are, um, you may know that we make the world's most efficient solar cells and panels. And we offer those all around the world to customers everywhere, as well as in the US, where we package them as solutions for residential and commercial customers. And so it's my team's job to make our software at SunPower as amazing as our hardware. We're here today to talk about a new technology we've built on top of Google Cloud that we think does that. But first, let's talk hardware. So this is the Solar Stratos plane that will soar to 80,000 feet into the stratosphere powered just on solar cells. Specifically, sun power solar cells. Why? Because our cells are up to 22.7% efficient. And that's exactly the kind of power output you need when you have a limited wingspan with which to power a plane. This plane and this team prove that solar's here, it's ready now, it's ready for the most uh, difficult applications you can throw at it, and it's powerful. It's also powerful enough for Google, or rather Google and Alphabet's spin out Project Loon. Project Loon, if you're not aware, um, sends balloons aloft for months on end to provide internet service to remote parts of the world. And you can see down here, it's running on sun power solar panels in very low temperatures all, all times of the day. And those are the very same cells that go on homeowners' roofs here in the US and around the world. 
You can see them up there. It kind of looks like a skylight. We've made 10 gigawatts of solar power since our first factory opened. That's equivalent to, setting off, uh, to offsetting 40 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, or roughly taking 9 million cars off the road for a year. That's a lot of solar. But even as solar has taken off, um, we've only reached about 3% of American homes. So we have 97% to go. And I think that we have kind of two big problems that we need to solve to get to that 100%. First, I'd say we have an awareness problem. Homeowners and businesses don't realize the extent to which solar can save them money, can help the environment, and also decentralized energy can provide a degree of energy independence. And secondly, we have a workflow problem. Getting that solar panel on the roof um, and getting it designed and getting it installed is actually a very difficult thing to solve. And so we try to solve both with software. We want to make solar as easy to buy and install as any other consumer electronics. So who here remembers televisions? Raise your hand. Yeah, not quite a relic of the past yet, right? But buying a TV is pretty simple and pretty easy. They come in some pretty standard sizes, right? You got 65 inches, 55 inches, all the way down to 32. And so when you're going through the process of buying a television as a, as a consumer, you think, I have a wall. I have a credenza. I have a, a media center. Does the TV fit? Can I see it from my couch? It's pretty simple, right? Um, understanding what size of television, how much TV you need. Well, solar is not that simple. Um, every house is different, every roof unique. Um, we're pointed in orientation toward the sun in different ways. There are pipes and chimneys you can't see here in this simplified diagram. And it becomes a very complex process. It becomes a custom widget for every homeowner. And so that's our challenge. How do we simplify that? And I'll show you the state of the art. I'll show you how we actually quote today. The quote is so important um, to understanding the value proposition to the homeowner and to providing them an accurate estimate of how much energy they'll save and how much money they'll save. And so here's how we do it today. We take a look at the roof. This, this is actually deceptively complex. And we say, OK, there's a chimney down there. There are five skylights. Can't put solar there. And I don't know if you see this right there, but those are little pipes. They're really hard to see, actually hard for our design team to see. And there are about nine of them, at least nine of them that I can see with my naked eye. But that's not all. There's also lo local jurisdictions. And you have to take those into account as you're designing a solar power system as well. And so most, most towns and cities and counties require walkways um, along the ridge line and along um, the front and the back of the house so you can actually access the roof at any time. And so it gets, it gets even more complex. There are trees and bushes all around the house, and those are shading the house. So it's kind of like hard to know where exactly should I put those solar panels, and how tall are these trees? Because this isn't just a two-dimensional problem. This is a three-dimensional problem. This house actually happens to be on a hill, and the trees, some are higher, some are lower. Can't tell that from the overhead view alone. And so our designers spend 30 minutes per house thousands of times a week to generate a solar design. And I'll show you a sped up video of how that works. Here it is. They're outlining the roof. This is the current state of the art sped up 50x. This is what they do 2,000 times a week to generate solar designs for our customers. Making sure all the roof planes are in the right spot, putting in those walkways, getting the roof plane just right, putting in more walkways. So we're about five minutes in right now. Um, getting the pipes and the skylights. So there are 100 million future solar homes in the United States. At our current pace, it would take us a century to design them all. Who has time for that? I don't have time for that. The planet certainly doesn't have time for that. So there must be a better way. And we are here today to talk about it and announce it. We call it SunPower Instant Design. And it's built on Google Cloud. A homeowner enters an address and within 60 seconds gets a design back. We're using all the best machine learning that Google Cloud has to offer and running it on GPUs. I'll, I'll get a little bit more into how we're doing it. 
But we're very excited about this. We think this will change how people go solar. So here's how we're doing it. We're taking SunPower's years of uh, design expertise, the hundreds of thousands of solar designs we've created, along with our world-class sales platform that we use today, called Eddy, and we're mashing it together with what Google brings to the table, which is GCP, uh, which as you heard is a, a zero carbon emission platform, which is great. We got zero carbon emission making more zero carbon emission, as well as Google Maps and sunroof data. Google has great imagery of the world, and we use that as our raw data to, to make this all happen. Let's go a little deeper. Let's go deeper under the hood. So SunPower has those hundreds of thousands of designs per year. Google has the raw data. We train a model using and annotate roofs put them in a cloud storage bucket, train the model in Cloud ML Engine, um, and then every time a homeowner enters an address, uh, we run it through that engine to detect the roof and look for the obstructions. Basically just what you saw before that we did manually 2,000 times a week. We then, once we have the, the environment characterized, we lay out the solar panels, we do a shade analysis, we create an energy estimate, and then out pops the design. That actually is a computer-generated design. So I'll show you instant design. Now, I have to say we're a little scared of the um, curse of the live demo. So this is a video. It's actually at um, real time, not sped up. But you can go check it out for yourself, the working software, um, all the way over there at the industry pavilion, um, where we'll have people to demo it all week. So here it is. And this is a test environment. This isn't really what the homeowner would see but we got the technology up and working and we're pretty excited to share it. Homeowner enters an address, um, our favorite test house, clicks create design. We're doing all the same stuff you saw before. This is a however in real time, outlining the roof, looking for the obstructions, looking for the trees, laying out the panels, figuring out the shade, which then lets us get to the energy. And then, you know, 60 seconds later, um, we get a design. So it might be a little bit of a way, actually it's faster than that. That's real time. That's about 17 seconds for that particular house. Um, and you can see it is in 3D. Well, maybe I'll show it one more time. Oh, back. So it actually takes almost as long to enter the address as it does to run this. And we're very fortunate um, to be using a platform that lets us go really fast. I've never appreciated GPUs as much as I do today um, and how fast they can actually process all this very intensive data really quickly to get answers for homeowners fast. So you see the 3D model there. We have all the obstructions. And then we have the energy data as well as much more up behind that. So let me show you, um, these are all designs made with instant design. Um, these are all computer generated, no human in involved whatsoever. Uh, and you'll notice that they're not perfect. You know, a couple panels might be uh, askew or we might be missing a spot where we could place another couple. And that's okay. As we do this more, and as we train the model more, it will only get stronger. You'll also notice, if you're an expert in solar, that we have panels on the north side of the roof. We have some panels facing northeast. Um, we've got a lot of panels everywhere. And that's also intentional, because we want to give homeowners the, the choice to choose the aesthetic and also system size that meets their energy needs. They get to down select from these, what we call maximum fit designs. Because some homeowners may want solar on the back of their house. Um, if it were me, I'd want it on the front. Be really proud about it on my own house. Some homeowners only need sun power solar, a little bit of it, because they have a very energy efficient house. And then some homeowners need a lot of solar because they've got an EV, TVs, pool, et cetera. And they need to run a lot of energy through their house. So let's zoom up. This is why we're doing this. If Google wants uh, a cloud computer in every hand or on every desk, SunPower is interested in solar on every roof. And to me, you know, applications like this to, to better um, the human condition and our health and the health of our environment are really the best uses of machine learning. So we see um, SunPower Instant Design as an early example of everything that we can do 
to move you know, the planet and the environment forward. <clears throat> I also think it's uh, one of the finer examples of what we can do with GPUs. So imagine if we took all those GPUs currently mining for Bitcoin and redirected them to mine for solar in the cloud. Could we design all those 100 million future solar homes in an afternoon, potentially? So we're very excited to launch this. Um, it's arriving this summer, and people in select California cities can go to our website uh, and enter in their address and then get a solar design for their home. Uh, until then, go to sunpower.com slash design to learn more and to find out when it's coming to your area. And of course, um, for everyone here in the audience and at, at, the, at the expo, uh, you can go actually check it out yourself at the SunPower booth in the energy section. Um, very excited to launch this, and thank you everyone for coming to our talk. Um, the three of us will be around uh, after for questions, and then uh, I was told also to move one forward ahead to say, complete the survey. So thank you.